universities and the government, the policymakers, have been very helpful because I think this is where you could see that countries where the policymakers actually work well together with the professors who are generating the knowledge, generating the science, churning out the data, understanding the data, understanding the epidemiology, that's where they pick up the, the, the useful lessons. So I think some of the partnerships that we have really has been very helpful in identifying what is the model for governance, including the relationship between policymakers and academia. I think one point I would just highlight that perhaps we may collectively have a, a useful role to play is in terms of where we can come together, firstly, in vaccine logistics. I think different countries right now are forming their own plans around acquiring vaccines, distributing the vaccine. But I think that the vaccine logistics also pertains to recognizing what is necessary for countries to respect the vaccination strategies in different countries. Like if I want to travel to Malaysia, if I want to travel to Thailand, and if I have been vaccinated in Singapore, to what extent would the public health authorities in Thailand or in Malaysia respect this vaccine vaccination, whether it is through a certificate or a passport, very much like the yellow fever vaccination passport that we currently have. Uh, and I think this is where the public health community can come together and actually help to drive some of the developments to allow border reopenings and to allow the recognition, the respectful recognition of vaccination across countries. So that is something that is not uh, retrospective looking, it's more prospective, but I do see that collectively we may have a very useful role to play to speak to our governments to advocate the right recognition. Um, and over back to you, Prof. Lo. Yeah, thank you so much, YY. So I think that's the beauty of uh, uh, a, uh, APEC itself, you know, with all these member uh, institution and uh, within, you know, the member institution itself, you know, in some countries, you know, they're doing very well uh, in terms of controlling the COVID. And this is where I think, uh, you know, our network, uh, we kind of learn from each other, you know, how to deal with our own situation uh, at, at home. Uh, can, can, can I hear from Professor Samuel Wong, please, from Hong Kong? Oh, yes. Thank you, Professor Lo. Uh, I just want to uh, share our experience. Uh, we launched a, a social behavioral uh, response survey uh, after 72 hours after the first outbreak uh, of COVID-19 in Hong Kong, and we share that on the website, on our school website. And that got picked up by someone from Imperial College London in the UK, and they use the same survey so that we work together and look into the cultural differences in terms of how people behave differently to the COVID-19 in terms of how behavior change. So for example, we found out that mask wearing is totally different between the UK and Hong Kong. We have more than 95% of people wearing masks, while over there is like 20 something percent. Also the trust to the government is quite different. Um, and then we, we look at other collaborators. So we started the same survey in Pakistan. So we now have three different places. In terms of the response, for example, there are more gender differences in Pakistan compared to Hong Kong. So I guess one thing is to, um, to publicize the, some of the tools that we have, uh, such that we can put some places where very convenient for people to use and to share. Um, and I think maybe using the English language, et cetera, or some translation tools will be good uh, so I think I think APEC could be one of the way whether we can disseminate information very quickly with tools that uh, we can share to be used as a platform uh, such that um, I, th I think when we do uh, international comparative research, uh, I think some of the reviewers will be much more interested in knowing the uh, differences and similarity between each country such that the government or the uh, bodies can issue guidelines and recommendation. And sometimes there are differences in terms of the guidelines recommendation in each uh, jurisdiction because of cultural differences. So that's something that I just want to share. Thank you, Professor. Right. Thank you, thank you. That's important, yeah, the cross-cultural you know, uh, exchange. Uh, can I hear from uh, Prof Sunet, please, from Sri Lanka? Well, um, I will talk once again, Prof. Um, yes. I there is an uh, uh, interesting innovation that uh, uh, we'd like to share with you because, uh, you know, very early into the pandemic, 
uh, we um, our um, uh, you know the team uh, the digital health team at the University of Colombo um, customized the global DHIS2 platform uh, for uh, this uh, COVID disease surveillance and. Uh, I think my colleague is showing that to you on the uh, on on the screen now, and uh, now this is an innovation which has now got globalized. It's been used in uh, more than 50 countries, and uh, on the screen you can see the countries where it's uh, deployed. And I think uh, what uh, what is highlighted here uh, is the um, you know uh, when you as you know lots of digital innovations came. Uh, uh, as a result uh, to the pandemic, as a response to the pandemic. And uh, uh, because uh, this uh, innovation happened on an uh, open source platform, which is deployed in more than 80 countries, uh, in a very short period of time, uh, it has now really gone global. And uh, this, uh, I think, was also showcased uh, uh, in um, uh, at the uh, UN General Assembly uh, in uh, a few months, a couple of months ago, uh, as um, uh, as an uh, you know innovation coming from uh, uh, Sri Lanka and that has uh, really grown global. And I think um, the message here that I want to really highlight is uh, you know when a lot of us, uh, especially in the public health community, are. Uh, Doing a lot of uh, you know digital innovations, and the um, uh, the advantage of uh, innovating on uh, already uh, available platform platforms that are deployed across the uh, world, as well as the uh, platforms which are supported by the international development partners. So the DHI2 platform, for example, is uh, uh, supported. Um, with funding from all the international development partners, and that has been uh, the strength of this. Um, so that has been, I guess, uh, Sri Lanka's biggest contribution in terms of uh, a global, um, uh, you know, collaborative partnership, uh, which was created from this country. And um, um, I thought I should share that with you. Please go and take a look at it. And if any one of you wants to adopt it, uh, please reach out to us because uh, we've got a, uh, a team of uh, people working globally and internationally and volunteering their time uh, to deploy these systems. And uh, we'll be happy to share that uh, our experience and our expertise with all of you uh, who are on the table uh, this evening. Back to you. Right, thank you, thank you so much. Yeah, uh, uh, similarly, I think in Malaysia as well, uh, we do have uh, similar software that we have developed. Uh, Professor Sanjay, I'm um, just wondering whether you'd like to share with the audience uh, with regards to contract tra uh, tracing and also the, uh, more, uh, the prediction modeling uh, that your department has actually done. Professor Sanjay? Oh, hi. Professor Sanjay is my colleague. Yeah. Yeah. So let me get it. Up. Um, so uh, what we have done here at the University of Malaya is we have uh, we have contributed to the COVID uh, prevention and control and management via a few platforms. So number one is we have Professor Awang with us, right? Who is actually leading a national group of epidemiologists in advising the Ministry of Education and the Minist and Ministry of Science, Technology and Innovation. Um, as part of this group, uh, Prof. Awang also heads the National Vaccination Advisory Team that actually ad is advising the, the ministers on, on how to move forward with vaccination in Malaysia. And at the department, we have been providing input to policy, to uh, for prevention and COVID-19 uh, policies through the media and through different different uh, committees. At the department, we have also created a dashboard actually. If you don't mind, I will share my screen. Uh, can I share my screen or should I put up uh, the- Yes. Yes, can you share? Yeah. So it's disabled at the moment. 
maybe I can just put it. Yeah. I'll put up the link. Oh. Yeah. The link in the chat. If whoever is having control of the right. screen can. Uh, wait. Let me just get Prof Indika. Could you please allow Prof Sunday to share the screen? Uh, the IT person. Prof Indika, the IT person there. Could you please allow Prof Sanjay to share his screen? Could you enable that feature? Yeah, we are trying. We are trying all this. Okay. Yeah, you can now. Okay, thank yeah, you. Prof Sanjay, go ahead. So I think you should be, you should be viewing my web the website, right? Do you uh, can you see my website? Yes. All right. Yeah. So one issue that we have had here is that information, we have daily briefings by our di Director General of Health, but we, are, we found that there was not so much information on epidemiological indicators by trends uh, in, in the open domain, meaning that there was a lot of information within the Ministry of Health, but uh, a lot of the information was actually closed in due to whatever reasons. So what, what the department did was the department came up with this dashboard that actually monitors the epidemic curves, the 14 days, uh, and this is a 14 day incident density stratified by states and regions so that for better policy making can be made. And also that we can better inform the different ministries within the government who, who advise the National Security Council, which, was, which is our coordinating body for our response towards COVID-19. And in the dashboard, we also have various uh, indicators such as the, epidem the, the epidemic curve, the cumulative incidence, health system capacity. And uh, one, one interesting thing is the transmissibility. That means the time varying reproductive number and uh, also on movement restrictions. So some uh, at various uh, periods of time, our government has come up with more intense travel restrictions and more intense, I think Philippines calls it community quarantine, for example. And so the idea here is if you have travel restrictions, you want to see a decrease of movement. So we also monitor uh, movement or mobility of the nation by nationally and by the states. So I think, uh, so th this, this dashboard to me is I think one of the first in Malaysia that actually has all of these indicators in one place. Thank you, Prof. Lo. Right. Thank you so much, Prof. Sanjay. This is indeed very useful, uh, you know, and it shows the collaboration as well, you know, with other agencies and especially with our Ministry of Health. Uh, right. I see uh, Prof. Sunit, you have been raising your hands, uh, you know, for long. Prof. Sunit, could you share your views, please? Yes, uh, I think uh, uh, going back to the collaboration uh, yeah. or uh, micro level i mean uh, in public health always we have to go back despite having all the digital platforms we have to go back in training and all the activities so our experience uh, during last four months is across uh, four countries uk brazil and ethiopia uh, we are having a, a collaborative a phd program on cutaneous leishmaniasis and the public health issues of cutaneous leishmaniasis so what we learned during last four months whenever we had changes in epidemic pattern. So sometimes it's in Brazil, sometimes it's in UK or in Sri Lanka. So our PhD students, when we adopt something in our community settings, the, the way they are dealing with the community and the way they are going to the community, we always discuss it in an online platform and then the other three countries learn from it and then they are ready for uh, when they're having such an incident in their country. So through this collaboration for sharing experience, COVID-19 response for PhD training in community. So we were able to learn a lot from other countries. Our PhD students learn a lot from other countries. And also they are having different strategies, different strategies that have not been used in our setting or in Brazil or Ethiopian setting so that uh, they had more uh, skills or more options when they are having issues in the community setting. And I think uh, uh, this this will be the same if we are having collaboration, especially in our region also as uh, suggested in this morning. So if we are having training programs, collaborative training prog programs, it will be a very good opportunity for our PhD students, especially if they really want to go to the field because uh, we can't wait another one or two years to go to the field where they don't have smartphones or any other way of communication to uh, do public health programs or do public health studies uh, 
field training programs. So the, our experience was that rather than having our own experience, when you are listening to others who are having the same problem, we always had better alternatives and better opportunities to train our PhD students. Right, thank you, thank you, you know. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, right, uh, before I pass the mic over to my other co-chair, I'm just wondering, my Dean, Professor April, uh, would you like to say anything about, you know, our faculty of medicines, uh, you know, how we actually deal with the COVID and uh, the medical curriculum? Uh, Professor April? Hi, um, I, I must confess I'm a little bit out of my depth at the moment, um, uh, given that this is uh, basically a public health forum and, and I'm a colorectal surgeon. Um, however, um, I have collaborated together with uh, Prof. Victor Ho um, on the hospital side um, in, in order to uh, devise our policies with regards to managing um, uh, COVID-19 patients, as well as how to uh, isolate them um, and provide sort of COVID-free areas within the hospital. Um, from the faculty perspective, we've had to uh, look at the um, SOPs, uh, the standard operating procedures in terms of delivery of uh, teaching and learning activities. But I think in particular, what we've had to grapple with over the last couple of weeks is uh, assessments, particularly high stake assessments, you know, exit examinations, et cetera, uh, for many of our clinical programs that has meant that we have had to revise the uh, methods of assessment at a very short notice and we've had to come up with um, uh, workflows and, and, and policies regarding the handling of the candidates for the examinations as well as uh, for how we handle patients. In fact, in a number of situations, we have uh, resorted to using simulated patients um, uh, in order to reduce the, the traffic uh, of um, um, uh, patients to the hospital. So, so it's been quite intense. Uh, but I'm happy to say that we've managed to conduct all our exit um, examinations uh, safely. And uh, interestingly enough, um, we, we had had to defer the exit examinations by six months uh, because of the um, initial strict lockdown. Um, but that, that interestingly enough has uh, been reflected in better passing rates for many of the specialties. So, so perhaps that extra time has, has uh, been to the benefit of the candidates. Yep, so that's, that, that's all from me. So, so there's a blessing in disguise then with the COVID. It, it seems to have been, yeah. The passing, rate, the passing rate increase, you know. So because of the lockdown and the MCO, you know, uh, it gives the student more time to, to learn. Thank you so much, Professor April. Thank you. Right, uh, can I pass it to my co-chair, Professor um, Jaya? had a very wide-ranging discussion and uh, I was uh, wondering whether there is a way to summarize it. I think uh, the, um, uh, the, uh, uh, the way to summarize it would be, I guess, to say that, um, you know, the way we've had to deal with uh, the unprecedented uh, challenges that uh, uh, COVID um, uh, posed to all of us was to maybe initially to deal with the situation. And as we get, as we are all getting on to the uh, second wave and, uh, you know, probably trying to learn to live with it, uh, we've, um, we are coming into a state where we can actually now start thinking of, uh, you know, more, um, a, a, a more resilient, uh, lasting uh, ways of dealing with the, uh, 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 with the new normal as it were and going forward. Um, I think um, uh, there was a lot of learning across the board uh, this afternoon uh, uh, from all uh, the um, deans and uh, program directors and uh, the others who participated. And I think it has been a, a fascinate, you know, fascinating, uh, you know, an hour and a half, I think, of uh, listening to everyone. Um, so going forward, um, I guess, uh, there's got to be a way of um, actually capturing these um, uh, these uh, experiences and uh, um, and documenting it. And I would 
like to urge the president uh, to take the leadership uh, in that. And I'm sure all of us uh, from the different um, medical faculties uh, around the Asia Pacific region uh, would be happy to, um, you know, contribute um, uh, in a multiple ways uh, um, as um, the, uh, uh, as we, uh, you know, saw from the presentation made by the last speaker. Um, we've uh, got uh, the uh, different experiences, uh, um, not only the public health response, but also in the way we've, uh, you know, the different medical faculties adapted to the uh, challenges of conducting examinations and other aspects as well. So um, um, my message as a, um, uh, or my request uh, to APAC is uh, let's try to um, document uh, these uh, for the future um, uh, in a not in, in a, maybe outside of the traditional boundary of an academic paper uh, in a different form um, so that it would become a collection of uh, shared uh, learning which uh, maybe down the years all of us can look back at and reflect on on how well we or how badly we have done maybe another 10 years down the line uh, uh, in terms of our response um, uh, to the uh, pandemic. So, uh, yeah, so those are my kind of uh, summarizing or parting words that I have. Uh, and um, I hope uh, that uh, uh, APAC under your leadership uh, could take the uh, initiative uh, to uh, uh, take that forward. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Vijara. Yes, I, I think, uh, you know, uh, all these deliberations and its discuss, uh, discussion at, at this meeting will definitely be documented and uh, perhaps will be uploaded in the uh, uh, APEC uh, website and to be shared, you know, among all the member uh, institutions. So um, I, I think we have all come together to advance uh, uh, academic public health uh, through partnership collaborations and, and actions. So I think basically the take home message is that I think educational uh, institution, uh, we do need to transform to address our current and future public health needs. And, and as well as the next generation of uh, uh, students uh, by focusing on perhaps the interdisciplinary and competency-based uh, ed education as what we have discussed. And also, you know, a flexible uh, uh, curriculum and a multiple avenues uh, to enter all these uh, educational uh, pathways. And also, I think the global educational partnership are extremely vital to ensure the future of public health uh, workforce uh, is prepared to meet challenges of tomorrow because we never know, you know, when the next uh, pandemic it's, it's going to happen. So with that, you know, I, I, I take upon, you know, all these views, you know, uh, to be addressed and also the actions that uh, APAC, you know, as an organization, public health organization, uh, could do to make this field, to move this field uh, uh, forward. Uh, with that, uh, I will end this discussion. And thank you all, thank you to all the deans out there uh, uh, for your input. Thank you so much and have a nice uh, uh, evening. Oh, excuse me, may I add finally uh, one uh, sit -up. Okay. Yes, Professor Kagawa, any, yes. Any education should be evaluated by the performance and uh, uh, as Bloomberg published the COVID resilience ranking is highest, is the highest in New Zealand, but uh, Japan and the other countries are following. Okay, we have uh, in our government, there is no uh, lockdown no punishment. Our government have very little work, little power on the people, yet the uh, resilience is very high. But this is a point that uh, any education or <clears throat> policy should be uh, evaluated by their performance. So that is uh, the word I would like to tell you, oh, uh, of course, Hong Kong and uh, uh, China uh, uh, has a uh, good system, but uh, 
they have some sort of enforcement, but the, uh, our government is really free. Uh, but the uh, public health education is very important uh, in our country. That is all I'd like to. Thank you for your listening. Yeah, thank you, Professor Kagawa. Yes, you know, it's performance based. Yeah, thank you so much for, for, for sharing that with us. Right, uh, okay, uh, the last request, uh, we need to take a photo and could everyone please switch on your video? Everybody, we need to switch on the video for the photography. Okay, is everyone in yet? Right, uh, are we ready, uh, Fatin? Uh, the IT person? Let us know when to smile. Smile from now on. Done. Okay, right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all and have a nice uh, uh, evening. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 See you at the conference tomorrow. Yeah, the conference yeah. officially, you know, start tomorrow. So I see you all again tomorrow at the conference. Bye yeah, now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Tomorrow, it's a 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 it's a